بسم الله إن الحمد لله رب العالمين هو الذي جعلنا مسلمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I would like to start by doing an inventory check find out who's in the audience today do we have with us any non-muslims you raise your hand not muslim yet you like the way i said that <laughs> i'm a positive thinker let, let me look on this side oh, on this side any not muslim yet how about up here okay how many muslims do we have raise your hand Ooh. How does it feel to be surrounded by all these terrorists? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. 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 They asked me to talk on the subject about priests, priests and preachers who enter Islam. Very frequently, I get introduced by people that really don't know me or know the real history and I get amazing credits to me that I never even knew I had. I've been labeled as a Presbyterian, as a Catholic, as a Baptist and, I, and by the way I was none of those and <laughs> I've been told that I was a bishop and a priest and I go, it's amazing. The problem happens actually when you tell the story in English, then they translate it to Arabic, and then somebody translates it back out to English. There's a word, kassis, which they use sort of as a general word to represent anybody who's religious in the Christian religion. But when you translate it back to English, it's just priest, that's it. So that's why they asked me to try to clarify that whole story tonight Inshallah, God willing, if you'd like to make notes, you're, willing, you're welcome to do so. And then you can compare the next time you hear the story and see how close it is. First of all, I never imagined that I would become a Muslim. In fact, I wouldn't have accepted that even as a joke 15 years ago. Nothing could be further away from me than such an idea as that. But one of the reasons is because I didn't understand what the words mean. So before I tell you the story, I'd like to share with you a couple of words. And then as I tell you the story, it'll help you to understand better. God willing, inshallah. The first word is the word Allah. Now I'm a Texan. I grew up in Texas. And everybody there in Texas, you know, we have our way of thinking and we think everybody thinks like we do. As a matter of fact, if somebody said the word Allah, we would probably say, why don't you say God like normal people? <laughs> Everybody else said God. But is that really true? Well, we can explore for ourselves. We don't need to have a genius to sit beside us and tell us how to think. We can figure it out. Christianity is the largest religion in the world today. Followers of Christianity make up about 1.7 billion. And from those people, the majority of them, single religion only, is Catholic. They're bigger than the Orthodox or the Coptics or the Protestants. The biggest group is the Catholics. Now, the majority of the Catholics speak Spanish, French, or Italian. Majority. Some Portuguese. Because that includes Mexico, Central America, South America, France, Italy. So you get the feeling that a large majority of the majority don't use the word God. He use the word do or Dios, but not God. 
Then if you look to the rest of the Christian world, you'll find there's a, you have a lot of people, they speak the Dutch or German languages. And they also don't use the word God. And in fact, if you go really across those 1.7 billion, only about something like 200 and something million are really living in America. Some English speakers in Canada, of course England, they'll use this word God. That's true. It's an English word. That brings us to another point. I think you see what I'm saying already. But it brings us to another point. And let us do a little bit of history now. I did our geography, now we'll do our history. There was no word God, G-O-D, on this planet a thousand years ago. Because there was no English until the Normans invaded the Saxons. Then we get the English language after that. That was 1066 AD. So I'm sure you know there were Christians before that, right? So then we had a question, well, what did they call God? Hmm. Another question for us, and this is a question in language. Are there any Christians that speak Arabic language? Yes or no? Yeah. Are there any Jews who speak the Arabic language? Yes. In fact, the Arabic language has been on earth since before people wrote down words because it's one of the Semitic languages. Semitic languages include Aramaic, Arabic, Hebrew, and some of the others that are pretty much extinct now. None of those languages use the word God to represent the deity. Again, that's because it didn't exist. But all of the people who speak Arabic know that the word Allah means the one God. Arab Christians today use this word. Arab Jews use this word, and they used it before there was English. You can prove that one real easy. You could go out and buy an Arabic Bible and look on page one and find the word Allah 17 times. Or you can do it the easy way. I like the easy way, the cheap way. I don't want to buy anything. Any motel or hotel huh, has a Bible in the drawer. Pull it out, open it up, and look and see what it says. They will tell you that they're real proud of the fact that they have translated the Bible into so many languages. And they give you a free sample of John 3.16. For God so loved the world. For who? God so loved the world. So they translate it and they put it in Arabic because the second language, Afrikaans being first, second language is Arabia. And you look and there it is in Arabic. Alif. Lamb, lamb, ha. Ah. So, this word is acceptable even to Christians who are trying to share their Bible with others in the Arabic language. So we've established now the common usage. Almost. One final point. There are 1.5 billion Muslims on the earth today. 100%, every single one of them know that the word Allah represents their God and they say this word, Allah. So, for the good old boy in Texas, the common word on the earth for the one God is Allah. Oh yeah. Only thing left now is to find out what does it mean? Does it have a meaning or is it just a name? There's a word in Arabia, which is Ilah. Ilah. Ilah means exactly the word God. Ilah means God. God 
in English can have a s after it, and that makes gods, gods, more than one. But in Arabic, you can't go s after something and it's more than one. You have to know how to use the language because the word opens up, grows in the middle, and then you can know without doubt that you meant plural. I want to give you an example of that. Kitab is book. Kutub. Kutub is books. Yes? Yeah. Another word, masjid, our word for what some people call mosque. Musk is actually masjid. And the plural, masajid. So you can tell real clear when something's plural. And there is a plural for God, gods. And there is a plural for ilah, awliha. You can make it plural, more than one. You can also take the word God and make it female, goddess. Do the same thing with ilah. You can also take the word God and make it mean the God of Abraham and the God of Jesus. But it's a little bit hard in English because you have to make a big G, capital G. My mother used to see it when she'd read her Bible, the big G. Instead of saying God, she'd say Gwad. So you knew she was talking about Gwad. You don't have to do that with the Anabia, because when you mean the only one God of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, peace be upon him, you say Allah. Because the structure of this, Allah, actually shows you who you're talking about because it can't be made plural. You can't put it after it. And you can't make it male or female. When you say Allah who, that means Allah he, he is, or he did something, etc. But the he referring to Allah is not gender. It simply means respect because you don't call God it. Likewise, you understand why he doesn't call himself he, she, because again, Allah has no gender. He's so uniquely one. Allah is not male nor female. Besides, that would compare God to his creation. He's not like his creation. Make sense? So Allah is the perfect word if you mean to say one God, by himself, no partners, not male, not female. Best word to use? Allah. Some proof about that is the fact, as I already told you, that's the word that was used for centuries before there was Gwad, as my mother would say. That's one of the words. That's why I use the word Allah, and I hope people will understand when I use that. Second word. Islam. What is Islam? Now, today, Muslims around the world are pretty much in a defensive position trying to say something nice about Islam and convey a message at the same time of a nonviolent status, of a beautiful way of life. And they will say, Islam is peace. Islam is peace. Have you heard that one? When I walked out here, I think I said salam alaikum, didn't I? Right? What does salam mean? Peace? Yeah. But if Islam means peace, I should have said Islam alaikum. Right? That's wrong. I have to say salam alaikum. So what is Islam? Let's look at it. Islam comes from the same root as Salam. Sin, Lam, Min. Silm. But from this root, you find that it has five things contained within it. First of all, is total surrender. Total surrender. And then, second, submission. Third, Obedience. Fourth, best word in English, sincerity. Complete, total. 
and five, peace. Salam is in there, but it's only one over five, one fifth. So when you say Islam, you're talking about action, verb, things that you do. You're describing, get back up here. You're describing your relationship with who? Go see the last word I mentioned, Allah. Your relationship with the Almighty is, or should be, surrender to Him, submitting to His terms, conditions, or commandments, and being in total obedience to what He has ordained for people to do. And to do it in sincerity, not to show off, not because somebody is watching, because you know you need to do it. And then finally, to do so in total and complete peace. It's not something new. It's a way of life described for us in the Quran, in the New Testament, in the Psalms of David, and in the books of Moses. Clearly, it's to do what God has ordered you to do. Follow the commandments. Worship Him alone, without any partners. Give up this life, the desires, the lusts, greed, passions. Sacrifice that to follow His will. The Ten Commandments mentioned twice in the Old Testament and referred to throughout the Bible are beautiful for Muslims as well. They're very clear. And someone in Islam should know that these commandments are for us too because they're mentioned in the Quran as well. First commandment, La ilaha illallah. By the way, you can talk. This is not Juma Khutbah. Yeah, you can answer me, no problem. So I say something and ask you a question, you can say it. So. Alhamdulillah. First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods beside me. Second commandment, thou shalt not make unto me any graven image. God's speaking in the first person when he says me. That doesn't mean Moses is asking people to worship him. That you will not take God's name in vain. Muslims are very, very keen about never taking Allah's names in vain. Even we don't jokingly call somebody by God's names. In fact, when we name our children, we call them the servant of Allah, Abdullah, the servant of the most merciful, Ab Ar Rahim, and the servant of the, the all patient, Abdul Subur. So we use these terms because of so much respect for his names. The next commandment says to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Sabbath means seven, not one meant the seventh day of the week. Hmm. We'll leave that for a discussion another time. Think about it. The next commandment, the fifth commandment says, and this is the first thing that leaves the subject of worship of God, says, thou shalt honor thy mother and thy father. And Islam says, after Allah and his messenger, the first rites go to your mother and then your mother, and then your mother, and then your father. Yes? It's not something new, is it? The next commandment, thou shalt not kill. Islam has that. I think it's in Surah Al-Mayadah, chapter 5, maybe verse 36, it's in that area. Whoever kills an innocent person, it's as though they killed the whole of humanity. But whoever saves a life, it's as though they saved all of humanity. This is more or less translation to English. Next one. Thou shalt not bear false witness. No lying. Ya yuladina amanu attaqala wa kulu kaulin sadida. O you who believe, speak the truth. Again, same thing. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Zina 
Is it forbidden in Islam? How many pages dealing with the subject of zina? No adultery. In fact, there is no marital relationships without marriage. No, nothing. No boyfriend, no girlfriend. Just get married. And even after you get married, no hanky-panky. True? Wow. Pretty familiar, isn't it? But it doesn't stop there. The Bible goes on to say that you will not have envy for your neighbor's ass, meaning his donkey. And I'm quoting to you from the Catholic Bible. It's a little different than the Protestant Bible. And you, the next one, it says, you will not have envy for his wife. Now, the Protestant Bible gives the women a little bit higher status and lets the woman be ahead of the donkey. I don't know why. But in Islam, we have real clear وَإِذَا hasadin إِذَا hasad. I'm seeking refuge with the law from the envier when he does envy. So it's also forbidden in Islam. We didn't mention anything about donkeys and wives, but it's the same thing. Make sense? I've got one other word and then I'm ready to tell you the story. The next word is Muslim. Now again, I'm from Texas, so down there we said, Oh, I'm old Muslims. But, you know, Muslims, we don't like that too much because it's actually somebody playing with Arabic to make it sound like Muslim. Muslim is people that do wrong things, bad things. And we don't want them to say that. Muslim, say moo, moo. Hello? I can hear you breathing. Say moo. Ah, there you go. Moo. Slum. Muslim. It comes from the word Islam. Whoever does an action, and you're using the Arabic language, you put mu in front of it, in front of the verb, in most cases, and you find the one who's doing it. For instance, our word safari in the English language comes from the Arabia safar, to travel. Whoever travels is a musafar. And believe me, sometimes when I'm traveling, that's suffer. But that's another story. <laughs> another word in Arabic, sully. When somebody is doing their worship, standing, bowing, prostrating, that's sully. The musalin, those who do this. Now, when you put mu in front of sully, musalli, you see how it works. Another one, have you heard this? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. That's called the Adhan. And when you do it, you become the Mu'adhan. Right? Did I get it right? Don't let me get mixed up here now. So if I want to do what God wants me to do, if I want to surrender to Him and submit to Him, Obeying his commandments in sincerity and peace. What am I? Muslim. In English, we don't have a word for it. You have to put all that together and say what I said. But in Arabic, Muslim. You believe in the one God of Abraham? Allah. You want to do what he wants you to do? You really serious? You're trying your best? Then you're a Muslim whether you know it or not. And it's on the day of judgment that the ultimate judge, al hakim will decide who the real believers are, who the real Muslims are, not me. There's a final word, deen. I didn't used to do this, but I found that it's necessary to mention this because of the mistranslation to the English language in Pictal and Yusuf Ali's translations. They use the word religion. English doesn't have a word to handle the word deen. Religion is really close. It conveys a meaning, 
so we grab it and we go with it, but unfortunately, it is not all-encompassing. The translators of the Bible actually came out with a word a little bit closer to the meaning when they translated what was in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The first book to follow the Gospels is Paul's book, Acts of the Apostles. In here, it tells you that Paul persecuted even unto death the followers of Jesus. But he doesn't call them the followers of Jesus. He calls them the people of the way. And they used the capital W to signify that this was the proper noun. And you capitalize proper nouns with a big W. Just like they did with the big G for God. Right? Way. People of the way. Ahudin was the reference he was talking about. How many Muslims in here would like to be known as Ahuldin? Please raise your hand. Ahuldin. Oh, you don't want to follow the deen of Rasul? In the deen, in the law of Islam? How can you be a Muslim you don't follow deen? Let me try that again. How many Muslims would like to be Ahuldin? Hello? He made up for it. He put two hands this time. Good. Alhamdulillah. I'm only saying it because it's important for the non-Muslim to realize what we're talking about. Our book, the Quran, tells us, in no uncertain terms, by the way, this word deen is used over and over and over, maybe more than the word Islam itself in the Quran. In Adina, in the law of Islam. Wa mam Islam adina, fala yukbala minhu. Yes or no? At the end of that one, Again, the deen. And how does it end? How many times do you think that word is in there? And if you keep saying religion, 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 you know what the problem is going to be? In some cases, it won't make any sense. How do you tell an atheist, Mulhid, Lakum Dinakum Waliyadin? He doesn't have any religion, but he has a deen, doesn't he? To you, your way. To me, my way. Make sense? Well, if it didn't, go talk to scholars, because I asked them, they said, use the word way. And then when I found it there, Paul's using the same expression makes sense to me people of the way the people of jesus time were called people of the way they were never called christians the bible said they were never called christians until after paul goes to antioch because paul said that himself they were never called christians until after antioch prior to that they were called ahudin people of the way did muhammad bring something new the quran says no the Quran clearly tells us in chapter 42, real clear, that this is the dina, deen, way, that was with Abraham. And it's the deen for you, meaning Muhammad Sallallahu and the deen of Moses and Jesus, Noah, are mentioned in this verse. Read it. It's not new. And Allah says in Surah Tobayana, Huh? How many times you got to hear the word before you go, oh, wait a minute, I got it. Deen. Ahudin. Oh, translation, sorry. The people of the book, the Jews and Christians, we're not ordered anything more than this, and Allah tells you, to be on the deen. He said, this is what they were ordered, to worship God alone without any partners. Keep religion clean, pure for Him. Establish regular salah, worship. Don't call it prayer, okay? They don't have a word for salah. Establish this ritualistic worship, salah. Pay the zakah, which means charity. You have to give charity. You have to give charity. You have to give charity or you're not a Muslim.
Allah said that in the Quran. Clearly, you're not guided by Quran until you give of the things that Allah gives you. First verses in Surah Baqarah. And Allah said, this is the deen most clear. And we're not going to call it religion. It's the way. It's the way to get to who? Allah. I want to be with Allah in the next life. And really, I want that for everybody here. I do. But the only way we can get there is to do it on his terms. I cannot make up a religion and expect him to accept it, can I? Can I go out into the bush, pull up some trees, carve them up into some kind of little statue, and start praying to those little sticks and stones and asking them to help me? Can I do that? Physically, you could do it, but would it work? Duh. How is a stick going to help me when I was just cutting it a minute ago and he couldn't help himself? Some people, by the way, carry a lucky rabbit's foot. I don't know if you have that in Australia or not. Do you have that? Lucky rabbit's foot. Have you ever heard of that? Very popular in Texas when I was growing up. Lucky rabbit's foot. There you get the foot. Put it on the little chain, wear it around their neck, put it on the keychain. You ever heard of that? Wasn't very lucky for the rabbit, though, was it? Get to think about that. I saw somebody as a, a driver, a taxi driver. He had a little statue in India. He had a little statue in front of his steering wheel. When I got in the car, shut the door, the little statue started to wiggle. I said, what is that? He said, that's my God. said, that's God? He said, yep. They said, but that's only one God. I said, okay. He said, that's the God for driving around, the traveling God. <laughs> I said, you know, when I slammed the door, I noticed he wiggled a little bit. If you're a traveling God, you better put a seatbelt on him. <laughs> Otherwise, he's going to fall on the floor. You have a problem. What's amazing is his comment back to me because I'm playing with him a little. You know, I just, what if it falls on the floor? What if it breaks? He said, I'll just go buy another one. <laughs> Besides, he smiles, reaches over and grabs it. It has Velcro on it. So you can make up a God with Velcro on it. You can go out and cut up sticks and stones and play around. But do you really think that's going to benefit you? Who created everything? Who created the heavens and the earth? And you ask the people, and they'll say, Allah, God. And who created the sunset? And who created colors and beauty? Who created you? They'll say the same thing, God. Is that right? Yeah, they'll say that. So the question becomes, then, why don't you want to worship him on his terms? Why do you want to make up a religion? Good question. Having said that, introducing the subject and giving you the meaning of the words that I'm going to be using, I think it's time that we start up now and tell you the story about priests and preachers entering Islam. First of all, Muslims should always begin whatever they do with Bismillah with the name of Allah. But there are a lot of people that say they believe in one God, but what do they believe? And I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Suppose we're going down the road, you know? Maybe, as an example, we wanted to drive from here to Perth. Would that be a trip? That'd be a trip, wouldn't it? So as we're going along in the middle of nowhere, all of a sudden we see somebody out there hitching a ride. So we say, wow, man, look at this guy out here in the middle of nowhere. Let's give him a ride, you know. And then we'll share the message of Islam with him, and who knows what will happen. We'll call it Dawah. Give him the invitation, right? So we slam on the brakes. He gets in the car, you know. Hey, where are you going? We're going to Perth. Where else are you going to go? So the road only goes one way. Okay, so here we go. And along the way, we say, you know, we're Muslims. He goes, really? I heard stuff about you guys in the newspaper news and stuff, you know? What do you guys believe? We believe in one God. He said, me too, man. No joke, yeah. He said, I only believe in one God. Hey, cool. It's almost a Muslim already. But we believe that he's 
really one? He said, yeah. We don't believe he's three. No, 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 no. I'm a one guy. One. One guy. Okay. Oh, yeah. And we believe that you have to do what God wants you to do. He goes, yeah. That's what I think, too. We're going, hey, that's it. Far, far as I'm concerned, he's a Muslim. Give him shahada. Shadr la ilaha illallah. Shadr Muhammad Rasulullah. And takbir Allah Akbar. Takbir Allah Akbar. Takbir Allah Akbar. That's it. Give him a Quran. That's done. But along the way, he said, stop the car, stop the car. Whoa. We stopped the car, and he runs out in the desert. But there's this huge tree. Nothing else out there but this huge tree. Huge. He runs up in front of that tree, and he's standing there like this and bowing down on the ground of this tree. What's that? Could be a sutra. Could be. He comes back. We go, uh, what was that? What did you just do? He said, we believe in God. Yeah. Worship one God. Yeah. We do what God wants us to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, that was God. I was saying thanks. <laughs> oh. Get it? What did he mean when he said it? What was in his mind? What's he trying to say? Some people put God in the creation. Some people put God in the creation. And if they do that, they're always going to come up short. A little later, we're going to go into that and break it down. But now I want to tell you what happened to me. And this is how it started. My father was an ordained minister and a businessman at the same time. Non-denominational Protestant. Just for the record. I also had become a preacher, but I was also a music minister, meaning that I spent a lot of time playing music, selling musical instruments to the church, etc. And one day, Dad came to me and he said, we're going to be doing business with a man from Egypt. I said, hey, good. He said, yeah, we're going to be, you know, importing things and selling them in our stores. I said, it's good, man. Nile River, pyramids, the Sphinx. Abu Hu, you know. Cool. He said, yeah, and he's a Muslim. I said, a what? He said, a Muslim. I said, ma, dad, you know, I wasn't going to have anything to do with it. You know, those guys are terrorists, hijackers, kidnappers. They don't believe in God. They kiss the ground five times a day, and they worship a black box in the desert. That's what we knew. That's what we'd been told. SubhanAllah. Dad said, well, I want you to meet him. I said, no way. He said, you have to meet him. I said, no. Dad said, you will meet him. No, it's my dad's house, dad's business, and I'll meet him. But I said, it has to be on my terms. He said, okay, what's your terms? I said, I got to come straight from church. I'm going to come straight from the church and... I'm going to have on my cross, have my Bible, and my cap that said, Jesus is Lord. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Dad said, okay. And I'm going to bring my born-again wife with me, and we're going to really pray this man into salvation. He said, okay. We came straight from church on Sunday afternoon, went to my dad's store. And by the way, in the United States, you can be open on Sunday. <laughs> so we went there. I said, where is he? No, I'm expecting to see some guy in a long, you know, black dress and some kind of what we call a baya over it or bish, and maybe a big turban on his head, eyebrows that go all the way across from one side to the other with a big sword. I'm looking for Ayatollah Khomeini. <laughs> but it surprised me. Dad said, here he is. I went, where? This guy? I'm expecting big beard. This guy has no hair at all, not even up here. He's bald. <laughs> and when I shook his hand, I was surprised. It's warm, like a human being. 
Last week in Sydney, after our program, the daughter of one of the ministers that was there came to us and she said she was so surprised. She said, you guys are human just like us. <laughs> wow. I think we need to get a new press agent. We're not doing very good with our PR. So, I asked him straight up, do you believe in God? You know, like mom, God. He said, yes. I'm talking about the God of Abraham. He said, yes. Moses? Yeah. David, Solomon? Yeah. Hmm. You believe in the Bible? Do you believe in the Old Testament? Yes. Psalms? Yes. Yes, but do you believe in the precious name of Jesus? I said, yes. Well, this is going to be easy. <laughs> yes, sir. I told dad, let's, let's, yeah, bring him on. That'll be great. In fact, we got an extra place out at the house. Let him stay with us. Dad said, don't try to convert him. I said, me? Hmm. So I decided that here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work with this man day and night and witness to him. That's what they call it in Christianity. Showing him the Bible until he realizes the truth and he becomes a Christian. Now, along the way, we were working together. I was very impressed with his work ethics. He was a very honorable, honest, and truthful person. Had to admire that in him. Really had to admire it. I couldn't help but notice that it didn't matter what it was, he was always fair to the customer. And unlike some people I knew, he never talked about people behind their back. Usually after a customer walk, I don't know, if you're, you go in a store and you act like an idiot and you see this, the clerk is standing there going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No matter what you do, mm-hmm, customer's always right. <laughs> as soon as you leave, what an idiot. <laughs> he never did that. That was amazing. And driving, our business took us a lot of miles every day. And while we'd be driving across country in Texas, it's big. Not as maybe like you got here, but big. I would engage in certain kinds of debates with him. Amazingly enough, he avoided debates and just keep throwing questions back to me. Just to think. Finally, he told me, you know what? I'm willing to go to your religion. I'm willing to go to your religion if your religion is better than my religion. Well, that's easy. There's no religion in the world easier than Christianity. Is it? All you gotta do is say one thing and that's it. One thing, you're done. Good to go. Let's start filling up the bathtub. We're gonna dump that boy tonight. We're gonna baptize him. But then he threw me a curveball. I don't know where it was coming from. Maybe he watched those cricket players or those rugby guys or something. Man, it come from nowhere. I, he said, but you're going to have to have proof. I said, what? Proof? I remember telling him, religion is not about proof. It's about faith, brother. You know what he said? In Islam, we have both proof and faith. And one helps us to get more of the other. I'm going, huh? I can see I need help. I have a friend in those days, another preacher. I had quite a few preacher friends. But this one particular one's pretty well known, at least in our area, because when he feels like, when the spirit moves him, he takes two huge beams, big wooden boards, bolts them together, carries it on his back like a cross, goes down the highway with this big cross. And then people stop and he gives out these little miniature Bibles. 
So I went to him and I'm telling him, you know, about this and talking about it. And I said, and by the way, he believes in Jesus, the miracle birth, the miracles that Jesus did with people to help them, you know, and heal them and restore sight to people that were blind and even bring a dead man back to life like Lazarus in the Bible. That's what the Muslims believe that I was telling him. He said, you got a demon. I said, what? He said, you got a demon. I said, I got a demon. How did I get a demon? He said, don't talk about them. Don't talk about those guys. And he kept putting the cross all around. Then something happened just real soon after that. We went to those great big prayer meetings. I don't know if you've ever seen them on TV where you got 5,000 people sitting in the audience all going, ah, ah, like this. He had a heart attack. Now that's funny, but not funny, but strange. Let me use the word strange because the guy on the stage is healing people and here he had a heart attack back there. First thing they said was call an ambulance. <laughs> he went to the hospital, veterans hospital there in Oak Cliff, which is south of Dallas. And I, I was glad because they said, well, it was a heart attack, but he's going to be all right. You just need to stay in the hospital for a while and take it easy and cut back certain kind of foods. And whatever you do, don't walk around that cross anymore. So I went to visit him on a regular basis. He was a good friend and I liked him. And I like to visit people when they're in the hospital. They, they need it, you know. A lot of times we forget people in the hospital, by the way. It's a good thing to go do that. And while I'm there, though, one day, a guy comes rolling in in a wheelchair because they shared the room. And I began, I always had my Bible under my arm, by the way, and I began to witness to the man in the wheelchair, Jesus loves you. He just looked at me like, get out of my face. <laughs> and I said, uh, where are you from? He said, I'm from Pluto. <laughs> well, now in Texas, we have a Venus, Texas. So I thought maybe it's a city I didn't know about. <laughs> but he was basically telling me to buzz off. I could have said the, uh, the word you guys use in Australia, but I decided buzz was better. Buzz off. <laughs> I tried to witness to this man, and I'm trying to read to him from the book called Jonah. It's Eunice. You know Eunice. We have him in the Quran. Well, he's in the Bible. The same story. He goes to his people in Nineveh and he, they don't listen to him. So he gets out on a boat and he leaves and a storm comes up. He goes in the water. The whale swallows him. He goes down to the bottom of the water. The only thing missing out of the Bible is like I consider maybe the most important point of the story is in the bottom of the water that, that Jonah says an amazing statement. Somebody copying the Bible, I guess, left it out because it's a beautiful statement. La ilaha illa ante supanaka ini kuntum minidolamin. Saying, there's no God to worship except you, Allah. The glory, the majesty is to you. And verily, I did wrongdoing to myself. Beautiful statement. Right after that, God caused the whale to spit him up on the land. He went back to his people, etc. You know the story. Anyway, I was reading this to him, witness to him. He started crying. His tears coming down his face. He looked up at me and he said, I'm sorry for the way I treated you. And I'm sorry for my behavior. I had no reason to act like that. It's just I've had a lot of problems in my life that I never imagined I would have. Just unbelievable. And I saw you coming at me like that. I just, you know, I'm really sorry. And I need to confess something to you. I said, stop, I'm not a priest. Don't confess to me, I'm not Catholic. We don't do confession. He said, I'm Catholic and I know you're not a priest because I am. I went, oh. We became very good friends. I was Protestant, he was Catholic. That's okay. When my friend got out of the hospital, I continued to go visit the priest and when he got out of the hospital I asked him to come and stay with us and let us take care of him well he got better he agreed 
and he came to be with us. Now watch. I'm on the way home from the hospital, going to my place. I'm telling him about Islam because I'd learned a lot about Islam. He told me on the way out, he said, you know, we already know about Islam. I said, why? He said, because priests have to study all religions and we have to study Islam. I already know about Islam. I said, really? He said, yes. And they do believe in the risen Jesus. He's with God and he'll come back in the last day. And Jesus is the miracle birth, etc., etc. He confirmed things which I'm just summing it up right now. It's amazing. If the priests know this, how come they don't tell anybody? We get out to the house, I introduce him to everybody. And now I've got a new plan. What we're going to do, we've got a priest, man. We've got an ordained minister, a preacher, a born again Christian, music minister. We've got everything right here. So around the table every night, we're going to pull out the Bible and we're going to witness to this poor infidel Muslim and get him to get over to the right way. Got it. This is a true story, by the way. I do turn things toward a joke from time to time to keep you interested, but trust me, this is the story as it happened. And sitting out there in the country in my dad's big old house, around that table, after we get through eating, clean it off, I bring out the Bible. And I begin to talk about the Bible, but my dad brings out his Bible and he begins to say, no, the Bible says so and so. I said, but dad, you've got the King James Version. And I happen to have this version. Actually, my dad had the Masonic version, which is still King James, because he was a Mason. And here we've got this revised standard. Doesn't agree. It says there are verses in there that are interpolated. It says verses in there don't belong, and other verses are not complete. And it quotes from older manuscripts. And in the beginning of it, the introduction, it says many good things about the King James Version. It says, but it, yet it has grave defects. Huh? So I'm trying to show the most up-to-date version of the Bible. Then my wife brings her version. Jimmy Swaggart's Good News for Modern Man. Boy, is it loaded up. But to be fair, he said real clear in a debate one time, he wasn't a scholar of the Bible. And if you ever read that Good News for Modern Man, you'll see that he could prove that. Anyhow. We realize that going around and around with the subject of the Bible is a problem. Finally, I tried to take some pressure off of us. We're arguing with each other. And then the priest says, he's got the Reims Douay Bible and that's got 73 books. We got 66 books. So where are we going to go with that? So I looked over at the Muslim and I said, how many versions you got of that book? You got that Koran thing. How many you got of that? One. Only one. In 1400 years, one book in the Arabic language. And every single verse is still the same, regardless of where you go. In fact, every single word is still the same, no matter where you go. And it begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and it ends with Minal Jannati wan Nas, and everything in between is the same, whether you go to Iran, or if you go to Saudi Arabia, whether you go to Indonesia, or if you go to Pakistan, or if you go to Maghrib, or Cairo, Egypt, or if you go to Texas, or if you come to Melbourne, Australia, still the same, doesn't change. The reason is because it's not a book, as in paper and ink. It's a recitation that's in the hearts and minds of the Muslims. And every single Muslim on earth would love to memorize the whole Quran. And every single Muslim on earth has memorized at least some of it. There's no Muslim that I met yet that didn't know how to say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The vast majority, and I'm not going to say 90% because people do that. I don't know. I didn't do the statistics, but 
all the Muslims I ever met. Well, we can do it right here. We, we had a few Muslims I noticed a while ago when we did the inventory. So let me just ask, are there any Muslims here that have memorized an entire chapter, a surah of the Quran, like Fatiha, raise your hand. Look around the room, folks. Hold your hands up real high so they can see. That's all up here, too. Everybody here has memorized at least one chapter. How about two? Three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty. SubhanAllah. Wow. Do we have anybody in Melbourne that memorized the entire Quran cover to cover? One? Where else? Usually sisters. I always find sisters that memorize it. How about half of it? There's one up here, oh, mashallah. And how many want to memorize all of it? Absolutely. SubhanAllah. And it's only memorized in Arabic. We don't consider it Quran if somebody stands up and said, In the name of Allah, the most gracious and most merciful, Huh? You're going to let him lead Salat like that? I don't think so. <laughs> so there's one book. I'm going, oh. And he told us. One. Never changed. Hmm. We have the original. Hmm. Let's change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> we begin to argue a new subject. Another night. The priest is talking about how Mary, you can pray to Mary. We're going, no, you can't. And St. Joseph. We ain't got no St. Joseph. We're Protestants. And we got to talk about God. And who is God? Catholic said, the priest said, there's a trinity. The church, he said, teaches the trinity. One, God. How's that work? I'm saying one God, but I don't know about the Trinity. We got really stuck on that one, so I went to my friend with the cross again. I went back to his place. Looked him up. I said, how's it going? I want to ask you a question. I'm getting stuck on the Trinity thing. I always get stuck on that one. Help me out. Because the Bible everywhere, it says one. No, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. And you have to worship him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. That's New Testament, Mark chapter 12, verse 29. And then Old Testament, you know no other God beside me. Beside me, there's no Savior. And who is that? That's the God of Israel, the God of Egypt, the one who brought them out of Egypt, the land of the oppression where they were. That's in Hosea chapter 16, verse 4. How am I going to explain three? I don't get that. My friend with the cross, to the rescue. He said it's like an apple. An apple. The apple has a skin. Inside the apple is the meat. Inside of that are the seeds. Three things, one apple. So there you go. That works. Now, you know what happened by the time I sat with my friend. We're driving along. We're debating again in the car. You know what I'm saying? Here we go. And I brought up apple. Skin, meat, seeds. He said, how many seeds? <laughs> uh -oh. It's more than three, isn't it? <laughs> he said, and what if, what if there's a worm in the apple? <laughs> Scratch that. I went back to my friend again another time. I said, okay, the apple, forget it. He said, yeah, forget the apple. I told him what happened. He said, forget the apple. The egg, babe. Egg. So how is the egg? Egg has a shell. Inside the shell is the white. Inside of the white is the yellow. Three things, one egg. Ha, that's it. Let's go. Can't wait. <laughs> Get back over there. You know, we're going along. I can't wait to open it up. We're driving out there. Just, okay. God is one, but he's like an egg. He said, really? <laughs> shell, white, yellow. He smiled. He said, what if it's a double yolk? <laughs> and what if it's rotten? Well, now, where am I to go with that? Well, help is near, by the way. And I meet a gentleman. Well, I'm out doing some business. 
He knows me as a preacher, I guess. And I tell him I'm having a problem with the Trinity. He said, you? How could you have a problem with I mean, look at you. You're the one telling everybody. He said, the easiest example is me and my family here. I said, how? He said, look at me. I'm one man, right? Yes. My wife is one person. Yes? Yes. And my son, he had a little boy in a stroller. It's one. Yeah. One, one, one. One family. Three people. Ah, oh, it's the family of God. Works. Let's try that one. We didn't get very far with that one. What happens if they have another kid? Twins, Tawam. What if they get a divorce? Ooh. I don't know how it is in Australia, but in Texas, if you get a divorce, the wife gets the car, the house, the bank account, the Keogh plan, your retirement program, any benefits, your computer, and all of your email. Now, I don't want a God that can have a worm in it. I don't want a God that can be rotten. And I sure don't want a God that can die, because people can die. So now I'm asking the Muslim, finally, I ask him. He didn't offer anything unless I asked him. He didn't push. What do you guys say about God? Is he one or three or two? How, what do you guys say? And listen to what he said. The translation, say, O Muhammad, they're asking you about God, say he is Allah, the unique, the eternally sought after by all creation for sustenance, yet he is not sustained. That's Samad. Samad is big, big name. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He's not the father of anything. He's not the son of anybody. He has no genealogy. And he doesn't compare to anything, anywhere, anytime, because he's so unique. Oh. Well, what's he like? He's not like anything in his creation, yet he is all hearing, all seeing. He's all knowledgeable. He's all merciful. He's all loving. Allah, dude. He's all praiseworthy. And he is the peace. Assalam. And he is the light, al nur. And he's the only one that you can turn to and ask for any help and get it. And when I'm hearing these words, I'm thinking, that's what I already believe. That's in the Bible. I saw that in a book, or this book, that book. I remember the New Testament said this and this. This is the God, man. How did we come up with three? Catholic priests provided that answer for us. Oh, yeah. He was very knowledgeable in the history of the church. I got it on my website, just in case you want to check it out. IslamTomorrow.com slash Bible. I put my commercial in the middle so when they try to edit it out, they can't, you know. IslamTomorrow.com slash Bible. I took it from the Catholic website so you could see it for yourself. They say that the church started in the year 325 A.D. After Jesus. Hello? And that's when they held the council to establish God could be three and one at the same time. That's also when they decided how many books need to be in the Bible and how many don't need to be. They also decided to change Jesus' birthday to be December 25th for some other God they already had in Rome. They also added Easter, the Feast of Ishtar, all of that at the same time. 
Now I'm hearing this coming from the Catholic right there telling me that's how it happened. I happen to know a little bit about the Protestant religion. It's a break off from the Catholic. And then when the Protestants broke off from the Catholic, they tossed out seven books of the Bible. That's why there's 76, 73 in the Catholic and 66 in the Protestant Bible today. Comparing book to book, gods to gods, it just was mathematically a lot easier for me. But that's not why I went to Islam. I'd like to tell you that it was because of all the rationality behind it, but it wasn't. It was something else. It's because when I thought about it, I realized that there's something inside of me that likes to do what I want to do, regardless of what anybody else says. But there's also a side in me that knows that this is wrong. I need to do what he wants me to do. And now I'm in a fight inside of myself between submitting to him, as we already mentioned that means Islam, or doing what I want to do. Guess what? While all of this was going on, I'm not the only person in this story. I'm the only one telling it today, but the real people of this story don't get out and tell all about it. So I'm telling their story for them. It was the priest who had the biggest job of all, not me. Because he was dedicated to his religion for so many years. He had been a, a, a missionary going into South America, Central America, Mexico, learning their languages and speaking their dialect, yet he was from New York. He was an Irish priest from New York. He gave up everything to be a priest. He can't get married. He can't have any children, of course, no grandchildren, no intimate relationship. He gave it all up for the Lord. That's an important concession for a person to do. We don't want to make fun of that. This man has given up more than any of us would really think about doing for our way. But alhamdulillah, Allah didn't ask us to do that. But this man asked our friend, because now we're calling my friend, he's no longer an infidel Muslim anymore. Our Egyptian friend, he said, can I go to your church? Can I go out there to your, wherever you worship? He said, sure. Took him to the masjid during the week. They came back that night. We said, what happened? He said, what do you mean? I said, come here. What did they do? They like slaughter animals or something? He said, no. He said, they stand the same way that monks stand in a monastery like this. Silently worshiping God. But then they do something that only the priest gets to do, which is a sajda. They bow and do sajda, but he just mentioned the sajda. He said, and it's so peaceful, there's no sound. It's so sweet. I said, what? That's not the kind of religion I grew up in, right? I said, okay, what kind of music did they play? <laughs> he said, there wasn't any music. I said, what? How are you going to worship God without music? So they didn't have any instruments. So I went to my friend, the Egyptian. I said, is that true? You guys don't have any music in your worship service? He said, no. No organs? Uh-uh. No pianos? Uh-uh. Now, we were in that business. Estes Organ and Piano Company. That's us. Hmm. How many mosques are there on the earth today? He said, millions. I said, hmm. Do you think the Muslims would like to start music in their services? <laughs> I see opportunity here. He said, I don't think so. And then, a few days later, the priest asked if he could go again to the mosque. Because the Muslim regularly would go. He would say, I need to go visit the mosque. 
even though they drove something like 25 miles, they would go and come back. That night, they didn't come back, and we were scared. We thought something happened to them. It got later and later and later and later. They missed supper, everything. Finally, they come up the driveway. We could see them coming in the driveway. Saw them get out of the car, start to come up to the porch. And I looked out. Right away, I recognized the shiny spot on the Egyptian. He didn't have any hair. But who is this with him? Who is this guy I see standing with him who's wearing a white dress and got a, one of these things on his head? And I looked, I said, that's Father Peter Jacobs. <laughs> I said, Pete, did you become a Muslim? He said, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah. I said, Muhammad Rasulullah. I was shocked. How could this be a priest became a Muslim? I went and got my camera. We used to have a TV show. That's this music jamboree. Got the cameras out. I was going to do an interview with him right then and there. Why did the priest become a Muslim? By the time I got everything hooked up, got the lights all turned on, he fell asleep. I didn't get to ask him. So I went upstairs. It's still running through my head. It must be after midnight. And I'm upstairs talking to my wife. I'm saying, my God, what's going on? A priest becomes a Muslim? What is this? Is this amazing? Look, they, one God, they got the Quran, so and so. And she said all of a sudden, I want a divorce. Huh? She said, I want to get a divorce. Okay. What happened? She said, all this talk about Muslim, Islam, everything, you know, doesn't work. I said, okay, okay, we don't have to talk about this. She said, no, we do need to talk about it. I want to get a divorce because you see, I can see what's going on here and I'm going to tell you, I remember what he said. Talking about Muhammad, the Egyptian. He said a Muslim can't be married to a Christian. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't say, I, did I say I want to be a Muslim? I didn't say that. I did not say I wanted to be a Muslim. I'm talking about a priest. Sorry, drop the subject, forget the whole thing. She said, no, I want a divorce. I said, why? She said, because I want to be a Muslim. Huh? Ah. Uh, now I've been married to her seven and a half years. I've got a couple of kids here. And I'm thinking, no, no. I don't want to go through that. Don't want to lose everything, including my email, you know. <laughs> we didn't have email back then. Anyhow. Well, I thought about it. I said, okay, okay, think, think, think. Okay, the good news is, the good news is, I'll do it. I knew I needed to do it anyway. Let me just do it, get it over with. I too want to become a Muslim. She said, I don't believe you. I said, no, I'm serious. I do, I really do. I, I just, I didn't know how to say it before, but hey, I want to be a Muslim. She said, no, I want a divorce and you're a liar. I said, no, uh, how do you say that? She said, either you're lying right now or you were lying five minutes ago when you said you didn't want to be a Muslim. Make up your mind and get out. So I was walking down the steps and I started thinking, where am I going? This is my father's house. I just got through it. Wait a minute. Now it's really late, but I went and I woke up the Egyptian and I said, I gotta talk to you. I gotta talk to you. I said, what's the matter? I said, step outside. We step outside. I said, a lot of stuff is happening in my life and I need to talk to you. And I began to explain and explain and tell him everything, what's going on in my head, things that happened in my whole life. Just like, you know, I gotta tell somebody. 
I probably made him crazy, but you know what? The best kind of friend isn't the one that really tries to understand you. He's the one that just stands beside you no matter what happens. And he did that. Not only stand beside me, he walked beside me because we walked those country roads all night long. We continued doing that until Fajr. And when the sun started coming up, I'm telling him, oh, it's time for you to pray. Look, look. He said, I'll be all right. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's okay. I said, but the sun is, you know, there's light. He said, we, there's time. Don't, don't panic. And while he was doing that, I realized it's time for me to stop trying to push on other people what I think or what I feel. It's time for me to deal with it inside. And this is the key, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam. This is the key. The muftah is inside, not outside. And when I went behind my father's house and I found a piece of board back there, big board, you know, a little shelter over it, nobody could see me. I put my head down on that board the same way I had seen the Muslim place his head the same direction toward the east. And in that position with my head on the ground, I said these words, Oh God, if you're there, guide me. I couldn't think of anything else to say. You sit here tonight, you know this is not a guy that has a problem coming up with words. Yet, on that occasion, that's all I could say. Nothing else came in my mind. But those words echoed and echoed and echoed through my heart, even till today. Guide me. And Allah said in the Quran, Edina saratu mustaqim. When I raised up my head, I knew what I had to do. I knew exactly what I needed to do. I needed to declare publicly that I believe there really is only one God. He has no partners. And that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his last and his final messenger to deliver that message. And that Isa, Jesus, was also the Messiah, Masihi, Messenger, and Prophet of Allah. So I went in to my Egyptian friend and the new Muslim, ex-priest, obviously the church didn't need him anymore. And in front of those two, I swallowed and I tried to say the words in Arabic, and I was shaking. And as I was saying it, I could feel the tears starting to run down my face. Because I knew what it meant. I understood it. Immediately, immediately after that, my wife took her shahada too. And entered Islam. I won't give you the whole story, just sum it up. A little bit later on, my father also entered into Islam. My stepmother followed just before she died. She said, there can only be one God. Jesus can't be a God or a son of a God. Has to be a messenger. So therefore, Muhammad must be a messenger. She said that in July and died in October. May Allah accept it from her, I mean. And since then, I've seen many priests, even bishop, archbishop, ministers, pastors, reverends, elders, nuns, and even one called discipler from the Methodist Church enter into Islam. Many of their stories are on our website. You can see them. We have videos there. You can listen to them tell their story. It's called Islam Yesterday. You heard me mention one website, Islam Tomorrow. I liked it so much I decided to get Islam Yesterday and that's where we put all the programs we did before, islamyesterday.com. But then I needed something a little bit more inclusive so I also have islamalways.com. 
Really? And we just opened a new one called chatislam.com. You can go there 24 hours a day. Our websites are open 24 hours a day and always plenty of free parking. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Before I leave the stage tonight, I would like to just give some nasiha or advice to us, and I hope Allah will accept this. He says in his book, you don't guide whom you love, but Allah guides who he wills. He asked us to deliver a message. He told us to go out and give dawah to the people, to invite them with a message of what? Worship God without partners. Yes? Is that the message? Try to keep that in mind when we deliver it. Because he also said, La ikraha fiddin. We can't force anybody. Islam never spread by the sword. And it doesn't spread by any other weapon either. It spreads by truth. If you consider truth to be a weapon, then consider what Allah said about it. Waqul ja'al haq. This is in Surah Al Isra. And say, The truth has come and destroyed all the falsehood, because it will always destroy the falsehood. So let us work together. This is my advice, suggestion. Nasiha. Let us work together to live as Muslims, to be all we can be, and let that be an example for the people. And then when we talk to them, we can be proud to say, come be like us, come be like us. May Allah accept your Islam. May Allah accept from me, from all of us and all the people. May he save all the people from the hellfire. Ameen. Now, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, huwa ladi jalani muslimin. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.